resurrection affects us today because we there's a danger that we think yes jesus was risen from the dead hallelujah and we're going to experience that resurrection when we die hallelujah but we miss out the middle bit we miss out what the resurrection means for us now so that's hopefully that's my prayer that god will speak to us about that so let's pray together heavenly father we thank you for the truth that we celebrate this morning that Jesus is risen, hallelujah, and we do pray that you indeed would fill us with that joy. But Lord, we pray also that as just so often you have spoken to us and encouraged us through your word, we pray that in your mercy you would do that again, that your word would shine through, that you would challenge us and encourage us and help us live in the joy of your resurrection, that we might share that joy with others. In Jesus' name. Amen. So I wonder how many of you have got bookends in your home. We have some bookends that hold our books up in my study. And I was going to take a picture of them, but they're so dusty and they're so um, complicated, carved, that I thought, oh, no, no, I'll never even get all the dust off. So picture of some bookends that do not belong to us. They're really useful things, aren't they, to kind of hold things straight. But bookends are not just things that hold books up, they're also the beginning and an end, maybe a word or a phrase that comes at the beginning and an end of a book that the author can use. So a literary technique that the author uses to come explain the gist of their message, to get over the main message. And all the gospels have these. They're fabulous, they're fantastic. And Mark, going the extra mile, he has two. And they're really key for us to understand what Mark is saying. Mark will say, if you don't read all of my gospel, make sure you get these two clear messages. He starts by saying in Mark chapter one, verse one, let me introduce to you Jesus Christ, the son of God. And then in his penultimate chapter, in chapter 15, verse 39, the centurion at the crucifixion watches Jesus die and says, surely this is the son of God. The same phrase. And so Mark starts and ends his gospel by telling us who Jesus is. Jesus is the son of God. And what relevance does that have? And now he tells us why we need to know that. And so he starts his gospel in Mark chapter 1 verse 10 after Jesus has been baptised. There's a phrase that says heaven was torn open and God's voice comes through and says, this is my beloved son. Heaven was torn open. And the same time on the cross at the end of the gospel, we read that the curtain of the temple, that curtain that was in between the bit where people were allowed to go and God was. That curtain was torn open. The same phrase, the same Greek phrase, which is a really unusual phrase, and it actually means the word schism. And so Mark tops and tails his gospel with this word to explain that the barrier between earth and heaven has been torn open by Jesus from the cross and through his resurrection. Hallelujah. And in the reading that Peter just brought to us this morning, we see Mary and Mary and Salome who actually saw Jesus died and they actually watched where Joseph put the body. Here they are, first thing on Sunday morning, walking to the tomb to anoint the body. And as they get there, they are worried that the stone is going to be too heavy for them to move, but they need not worry. Because, and we read in verse six, the angel says to them, do not be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. And Mark's gospel and the other gospels and the letters and the acts of the apostles give us the evidence for the resurrection. The tomb was empty. 
The women could not find the body. The disciples could not find the body. The Romans couldn't find the body. The Jews could not find the body because there was no body, no dead body. Jesus was risen. And then we read that the women met Jesus, Mary Magdalene met Jesus, the disciples met Jesus. There were numerous, over the next 40 days, numerous and varied sightings of Jesus. He ate with his disciples. He walked with them. He spoke with them. He appeared in a room. He appeared on the beach. He appeared on a mountain to 500 people all at once, we read in 1 Corinthians 13, 15. So the empty tomb and the sightings of Jesus, and then finally the changed lives of the disciples, that they were cowards hiding in a room and changed to people who boldly went across Europe proclaiming that Jesus is risen from the dead. These three pieces of fundamental evidence intertwine and convince me and convince Christians across the world that Jesus is risen just as he said he would. And the impact of that is, if we think about a criminal in jail, once they have served their time, once the, they have served their punishment, then they are able to walk free. And Jesus came to pay the price for our sin, the penalty for our sin, which was death and separation from God. And he satisfies it fully. He pays the price fully. And we know that because on Easter day, he walked free. Tim Keller says, the resurrection is God's way of stamping paid in full right across history so no one can miss it. So we rejoice in the fact of what Jesus has done. But I want us to move on and think for the next few minutes, how does that impact us? How does that change our daily lives? As we walk the streets, go cycling, as Sean and I will do this afternoon, how does it change our lives as we go to work in our neighborhood with our family? And to do that, I want to look at two passages. If you have your Bibles, feel free to turn to them, but they're also going to be on the screen. And as I was researching this, I found absolutely amazing that these two passages basically say the same thing, but they're written by different people. The top one in yellow is written by Paul to the church in Ephesus, and the bottom one in white is written by Peter. They're written at different times, and yet they are saying the same thing about the impact of the resurrection on the lives of believers. And certainly God has spoken to me this week. I hope that he will speak to you as you read them and think about them over the next few days. This is how the resurrection should impact each one of us in our daily lives. So let's read them. Paul says in Ephesians, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you might know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparable great power for those of us who believe. This power is like the working of the mighty strength which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And Peter starts his letter, 1 Peter, chapter 1 verse 3 to 5 with the same three main points in God's great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that can never perish never spoil or fade but is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power. So in both passages, we read that the resurrection will change our daily lives because it will bring us hope and inheritance and the power of God working in us. 
So let's dig into God's word and, and let's uh, ask God to speak to us about each of these things. Firstly, the resurrection brings us hope. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, that Jesus is the first fruits. He has been raised from the dead and is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So all who die in Christ follow what happened to Christ. What experience, sorry, what Jesus experienced, we will experience. He has a new heavenly body. And so we too will have a new heavenly body. That resurrection gives us hope for the future. And at Southgate, we've been thinking about hope since Christmas. So we're all kind of experts on God's hope. I hope we're experts of it in our lives as well. And we know from our studies since Christmas that that hope is not just for the future, but it is the hope for today because we all fear suffering and death and failure. We, feel, we fear the upheaval in society that has gone on and we are uncertain of what the future holds. We are fearful of an upheaval and unrest. And the resurrection life does not prove, um, doesn't like promise that things will go smoothly, but it gives us a hope that we, can be the kind of people who can handle whatever comes. Not in our own strength, we all know that. We all say, oh man, we cannot do it in our own strength, but through the strength of Jesus working in us, that he gives us enough strength to cope with each day, enough hope to cope with each day. When Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane, he had a taste of what the crucifixion was going to be like. He had a taste of being separated from his father. He had a taste of having all the anger and wrath of the world put on himself. And he, he stumbled. It, it says in, in Mark and Matthew that he was astonished. He was overcome with terror. And he had a taste of that ultimate darkness, but he did not abandon us. And if he didn't abandon us in his time of ultimate darkness, then he will not abandon us in our time of darkness. And resurrection triumphed over the darkness. Light won. Light wins today. I just want to read to you what Johnny Erickson says about the hope she has in the resurrection. Remember, Jenny was, um, through a terrible accident, was paralysed at the age of 17. She says, I, with shriveled muscles, gnarled knees, no feeling from the shoulders down, will one day have a new body, light, bright and clothed in righteousness, powerful and dazzling. Can you imagine the hope that the resurrection gives someone who is spinal cord injured like me? Only the gospel of Jesus gives people such an enormous hope to live. Only the resurrection promises not just a new mind and heart, but a new body that will be more indissoluble, more perfect and more beautiful than you can imagine. So the resurrection brings us hope, hope for today and hope for the future. And secondly, we read that the resurrection brings us a rich inheritance. Peter says, you have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, but is kept safe in heaven for you. Because Jesus died and came back to life, we have that freedom from guilt and shame of our sin. And Jesus paid the price. On Easter day, he walked free, the price is paid. We never, ever have to pay that price again. It's done. It's dealt with once for all, as the author of Hebrews says. And so because of that, because that's dealt with, we can then move into an intimacy with God. 
We can spend time with the alive, risen Jesus and get to know him and have that joy of friendship with Jesus, with the Son of God. It was wonderful to see my family yesterday. A real sense of joy and laughter and indescribable, isn't it? And that is exactly the same relationship we can have with the risen Jesus. What a privilege, what a rich inheritance we have. And Jesus said that because he was going back to the Father, do you remember he said to Mary, don't cling on to me because I'm going back to the Father. But because of that, he could then send his Holy Spirit. And as he sends the Holy Spirit, we can experience him in a deep and beautiful way. He told his disciples in, in John chapter 14, verse 17, I'm leaving you in order to send the Holy Spirit so that you will be able to experience me and experience God in, in more glory, more beauty and more greatness than you, than you could when Jesus was actually with them on earth. And I put the quote up from Tim Keller that actually says that much better than I just did. So please just have a second to read it. Through Jesus' resurrection, we have hope and we have a rich inheritance of living our life through the Holy Spirit. And thirdly, the cross seems a place of weakness and defeat, but in reality, Jesus triumphed. As we started the sermon and said about Mark's bookend, the barrier between us and God is abolished. And God gives the same resurrection power that he used to raise Jesus. He gives that same power into our lives to transform us by all his glorious might. You see, Christians are not nice people who subscribe to certain beliefs. But instead, Christianity is about a radical regeneration, the Holy Spirit changing us reorientating our lives, changing our hearts by his power so that that same divine mighty presence might be working through us and revealing Jesus to our community, to our families, to our friends. I asked Sean on the way yesterday in the car, um, how he would explain what difference the power of God working in his life was. And he actually gave a really good answer. So I'm going to quote him. Usually I quote Tim Keller at the end of my sermons, but no, we've got Sean. He said, I see the evidence of the Holy Spirit in my life because with my eyes, I am able to see the world in a different way. I see it the way that God sees it. And in my mind, I am able to understand his word and hear his challenges to me. Let's pray that we will be people who experience God's power, God's transforming power in our lives, so that we can become more and more like Jesus, shining out with his resurrection glory. I've put on the last slide that passage from 1 Peter. And I pray that you would be encouraged by that this week, that you might read that this week, that we might even learn it off by heart. Because we know that eventually all things of this earth will be taken away from us. Our friends, our family, our health, our control of things, which has been taken away a lot this last year. But what we have in Christ will be never taken away. Peter promises us that that hope, that inheritance, that power of God will never perish or fade, but kept safe for us. And so we can be secure in Jesus. Amen. We're going to spend the next five minutes thinking about what God has just said to us, but also watching the second part of 
the Easter story. And um, Tim Lovejoy shared with us the first part on Thursday on Wednesday evening. And it's a very powerful five minute video where Peter talks about the resurrection. And I love the last sentence where he says the resurrection changes everything. And please think about that passage that we've just looked at. The same Peter then wrote those words that we have just read. Thank you, Sean. Three pounds at the door, our hearts pounding out of our chest. They found a hiding spot. Get down, shut up. We wait for the inevitable. Nothing. False alarm. Three more pounds at the door. Let me in quick, she said. We opened the door and bolted back shut. Mary, what are you doing? You're trying to get us killed, we said. He's, he's, he's gone, she said. What do you mean he's gone? I didn't stick around for the answer. I took the bolt off the door and I just bolted. Sprint into the tomb with a million thoughts sprinting through my head. John flies past and beats me there. I catch up and John's just standing there, gobsmacked. The stone was rolled over. I stoop into the place where Jesus' lifeless body lay just hours before. And now it's empty. By the clothes he was buried in, folded up tidy. It was empty. We look at each other speechless. I mean, could it? Has he done the impossible, the R word? We couldn't even bring ourselves to say it. Or we just being played, I thought. Some kind of sick joke, some trap set by the Romans, rabbis, pilot, take your pick. We didn't hang around long enough to find out. We legged it back to the hiding spot. The others opened the door and bolted it back shut. And that's just before it happened. You know, the first time. <laughs> Should have seen our faces. I jumped out of my skin. We told Thomas he wasn't buying it. Till a week later, it happened again. Should have seen his face. You'd think we'd known better a third time, right? After things settle down, we go back home to Galilee. So we're down Tiberia Sea, right? There's me, Nate, Tom, James, John, the Zebedee boys. It's pitch black. We're hundred yards out, fishermen right in our sweet spot, trying to make a catch, thin and abysmally. Anyway, day's breaking and this randomer is wandering the shore. Any luck, boys, he said. Not a single sardine, we said. Try the other side of the boat, he said. So we cast our nets the other side of the boat. Now, what do you know? So many fish, not even math attacks could count them. It's him, said John. Well, what are we doing faffing about with all this fish, I thought. I dive straight in, splash, head down, swim to shore. I get there and he's lit up this barbie. How'd you get on with the catch? Any joy, he said. Bring him over here, plenty of room, he said. I look round and see the boys dragging out of the water what must have been the biggest catch I'd ever seen. Anyone for breakfast? He said. So there we were. Stuffing our faces with fish sarnies, just staring at him. We knew it was him. Well, no one dared ask. After breakfast, he asked me if I loved him three times. Yes, Lord, I said. As it brought to mind the three times I flat out denied him. Look after my sheep, he said. You got it, Lord, I said. He had, you know, done the impossible, risen. One time he asked us who he said he was. You're the Christ, I said the anointed one, the one we'd all been waiting for, the hand-picked rescuer. Still, I didn't see it coming, not the way it played out, but it was always part of the plan. He came to bear our brokenness to his breaking point, from fully perfect to fully broken to two days later fully fixed, so we can be forever fixed in him. Like I said, He'd done the impossible, risen, and there's no denying it. That 
changes everything. Amen. He's risen and that changes everything. Let's pray. Jesus, we praise you that you are Lord of Lords and King of Kings, that you are the risen Lord, and we glorify you this morning. We pray to you that you have given us a living hope through your resurrection, that you've given us the Holy Spirit, which is an inheritance that can never perish or spoil or fade, and that you shield us by your power. Lord, help us go out this week to live in the joy of your resurrection. Amen. Amen. Amen.